According to XJet, since 2015 there have been no deaths from recreational multi-rotor drone use, and only one death within the RC hobby, which was a death of the operator and not an unrelated bystander. Yet, in general aviation, there's anywhere between 203 through 345 fatal accidents per year since 2000. So why do so many clubs take flying our toys a little too seriously, and more importantly, why is the FAA stepping in and regulating our hobby like full-scale aircraft? RC flying fields are generally always on borrowed land. They might be set up on a farm, town properties such as a capped landfill, or even a vacant private lot. And often, the landowners letting us fly there are generous. The financial reward is often much lower than any other use of the property. Something like a safety incident might expose them to a lot more liability than they originally would have thought, and that would make them inclined to throw us out. Our continued use of public land relies on the public having a good opinion of RC flying, and a model airplane crashed into a busy road doesn't exactly help our case. So, as a result, RC clubs try their best to keep things safe, because a crash in the wrong place could mean not only the loss of the model, but a loss of the flying field for everybody, or even the loss of flying in that general area. And it's far easier and more likely. The second is that RC aircraft are admittedly actually dangerous if caution isn't used. It's rare, but people have lost fingers, limbs, and even been killed by them. And the general public, or the new guy at the field, usually don't understand or appreciate this fact. They are just toys, right? Sure, but they are toys in the same way a race car or a target pistol is a toy, not a Hot Wheels. RC has a history of regulating itself through AMA safety code and sometimes annoying but often effective club rules. As a result, we do have a great safety record enjoying this sometimes dangerous hobby. And to be clear, safety rules can and should be applied with some nuance and common sense. There are plenty of great clubs that do not insist that you treat a UMX timber with the same level of seriousness as a giant scale P-51, thankfully. Since 2015, there's been no fatal accidents, so one could argue each of them is safe, besides the fact that all AMA members are missing at least three fingers. We've almost found a way to regulate ourselves within the hobby, where there's extra rules for extra special pilots and a more of a bald eagle America f yeah approach within the tighter knit, more skillful clubs. Us RC pilots have an amazing track record for safety. In fact, it doesn't seem like the FAA has any arguments with that. Maybe that's because we've been so good at the self-regulation described previously. What they do seem to have concerns with is airspace safety and the potential for mishaps therein. At the surface, that seems just and fair. But if you look a little closer, you'll start to realize this actually makes very little sense. While the occasional video of a guy in a foreign country flying FPV into the cloud surfaces on YouTube, those videos have become rare. Videos of model aircraft nearly colliding with full-scale aircraft are non-existent. Our hobby has been trying to protect itself from further regulation, and usually these videos are met with a pretty negative response. It's also unlikely to show up at an AMA field, fly outside of line of sight, and get away with it. That is, without an earful from nearby members. So, if RC airplane pilots aren't flying in the air space they shouldn't, who is? <laughs> You may know this, but DJI is officially called Da Zhang Innovations, apologies for the pronunciation, which translated to English means Great Frontier. They arguably have lived up to their name. Despite being formed out of a college dorm room in 2006, DJI has since taken over the multi-rotor market. January 7, 2013 was a date the Phantom 1 was released, and subsequently, problems for the RC airplane community began. Videos started surfacing online of DJI products being flown everywhere they shouldn't be, even into garages. The Phantom series became popular with an entirely unseen market due to its consumer-friendly appearance and ease of use. I mean, hell, even the FBI is quoted saying, the DJI is the only commercially available consumer SUAV to combine ease of use, high camera resolution, and obstacle avoidance at an acceptable cost. And with its ease of use came smooth-brained idiots. Ten months after the release of the Phantom 1 came the FAA's first annual UAS safety roadmap, which outlined efforts needed to safely integrate UAS into our nation's airspace. More importantly, this marked the beginning of the regulation of our hobby. While most use cases were for positive applications, such as drone journalism, hurricane hunting, farming, search and rescue, etc., there's always a few bad apples that ruin it for everyone else. And we're not even talking about ISIS weaponizing them in Syria and Iraq for aerial bombing, because that did happen. Instead, you'd see the infamous DJI Phantom on the evening news talking about delays to flights, one that almost hit an airliner, or whatever else brought in views. DJI responded before the FAA could in 2013 with their first generation of a no-fly zone system. 
This system limited where DJI drones could take off from and even advised operators of areas to be extra cautious. The FAA responded too. On December 22nd of 2014, the Know Before You Fly campaign began. This was a website that was launched aimed at educating the public on how to fly unmanned aircraft systems safely, such as not flying where you could hit an airliner. Then, the FAA issued UAS guidance for law enforcement a few weeks later, and then a drone crashed on the White House lawn not even a week and a half afterwards. This unsurprisingly followed the first FAA No Drone Zone, which happened to be the DC area. On October 6 of 2015, a $1.9 million civil penalty against Skypan International was proposed for conducting 65 unauthorized operations in some of the most congested airspace in heavily populated cities such as downtown Chicago and New York. And guess what they were doing? Aerial photography with a multirotor. In the end, they reached an agreement with a $200,000 civil penalty. The following week, the FAA announced the creation of a task force to develop recommendations for a registration process for unmanned aerial systems, or UAS. A few months later, their web-based small UAS registration platform was announced, which required pilots to register their aircraft by February 19th of 2016. Skipping ahead a bit, in 2017, the FAA released an issue study on UAS human collision hazards. Surprise, they discovered that blunt force trauma, lacerations, and penetration injuries were possible. Side note, this isn't actually relevant to the story here, we just found this funny that they actually paid money to discover this information. Anyways, as many of you probably know, the Aviation Rulemaking Committee, or ARC, was established, which marked the beginning of Remote ID. Their sole objective was to help the agency, FAA, create standards for remotely identifying and tracking unmanned aircraft systems during flight. This happened all the way back in 2017. Then, the day all of us modelers dreaded came, and the first known collision between a drone and an aircraft occurred. And guess what the aircraft was? A US Army UH-60 which was struck in New York by a multirotor. Then, as a result, unsurprisingly, came more drone zones such as the Statue of Liberty and other major landmarks. The FAA then funded and released a report that concluded that a metal and plastic drone could do more damage than a small bird could against an aircraft, which really didn't surprise anyone either. Land Sea came along a year later, and in 2018, Remote ID was introduced. Then it was delayed, flying sites, aka Frias, failed to be approved, and then it was delayed again, and now most of the community is saying they won't comply, all while the AMA is patting themselves on the back for the hard work they did. It seems the extensions are over too. A common misconception is that the new regulation was delayed being approved, which isn't the case. It's been approved already. The extension just means that the FAA will not actually enforce penalties for Remote ID compliance for an extended period of time. But, as with any legalese, there's some fine print that states that they could, if you're really naughty. Now that you're caught up on the history of the FAA in regulating model aircraft, we can reach a few conclusions. First, there's a trend where one incident happens and a new regulation is introduced, followed by a lot more regulations being introduced before the next incident can even happen. Another conclusion that can be reached is that there wasn't a single incident of a model airplane violating airspace. Every incident the FAA listed themselves had to do with a drone, albeit usually a DJI drone. Is there a need for model aircraft to be subjected to more regulation? In short, no. In long, no, with an exclamation point. Our community has found ways of self-regulating ourselves to the point where we're literally a safer hobby than golf. That's right. In 2010, the NSC estimated that there were nearly 500 golf-related deaths that year. Or another common hobby, running, or in this case, running a marathon, left 28 people dead between 2000 and 2009, which is significantly more deaths than model aviation saw worldwide. Should we begin imposing strict rules on running and golfing next? We hope it's been established that the model aircraft community is safe, but that's not really even relevant here. What's relevant is the question of why are model aircraft pilots being lumped into the same category as drone operators? We have an entire organization, the AMA, apparently fighting for our rights as model pilots, and yet that seems to have done virtually nothing to curb the regulation being imposed on us. And to be honest with you, no one really knows why. In fact, this is pretty common worldwide, too. What's ironic about all of it is that those who actually will comply are model aircraft pilots, and those who don't are the same ones causing the FAA to implement regulation after regulation. Other countries have been hit hard by regulations as well, such as the land of maple syrup, otherwise known as Canada, if you're from the Great North. For a while, model aircraft operators were exempt from Canada Remote ID, which was required by all drone operators. Canada actually saw a difference between model aircraft and a drone, that was, until 2023, when model aircraft operators were no longer exempt. Remember the unmanned aircraft roadmap we mentioned earlier? We went back to try and find it to see how much of this was planned back in 2013, but unfortunately, it seems the FAA took down that roadmap because their link leads to a 404 error. Back to the original question though, why is flying toy airplanes taken so seriously? 
Some of it comes from guys who get off on having power over others or toy airplanes inflating their egos a bit too much. But a majority of it comes from the desire to try and protect our hobby. Every incident could lead to a knee-jerk like regulation from the FAA, and a large majority of modelers want to protect what little freedom we have left. So, does this mean we should no longer have fun at the field? Absolutely not. Use a little common sense for safety, figure out the norms of your club, and keep trying to promote model aviation as best as you can so generations can continue on and join it just as we have. Go ahead and give this video a thumbs up if you think we should get Greta Thunberg to join our fight. How dare you! Or maybe hit subscribe if you'd like to stay updated on the ever-changing conditions of our hobby. Happy landings, bounce one on for us, and we'll catch you next week with a new upload.